to the ocean, leaving devastation in its wake. Um, how does one overnight cater to the needs of 33 million people, greater than the population of Sri Lanka, New Zealand, uh, Australia, 95% of Canada, more than the people in all of New York State. And this is a compounding tragedy. We're still in the rescue and relief phase, but we see how this is going to get a lot more difficult. Because not only do we have the immediate destruction of the floods, that as I mentioned, 33 million people, 16 million children, 600,000 pregnant women waiting to give birth. But now with this massive body of water that will take many months to either uh, descend into the sea or evaporate, we're looking at, as the WHO has warned, a second catastrophe, a health catastrophe, with waterborne diseases spreading in epidemic rates and our supplies of basics like Panadol and anti-malaria medication not being able to keep up. And the, if the 33 million people have been affected, I mean, if you've seen the images, I'm sure there's, there's been videos on social media, etc., of the masses of mosquitoes rising from these waters and forming large clouds above. It is truly an apocalyptic scene. Now, not only do we have the flood climate catastrophe, the health disaster, but at least four million plus acres of standing crop or cash crop was destroyed in these floods. The income of small farmers, this is largely agricultural areas where we uh, have been affected. Uh, and, and one often looks at the images on TV, particularly from far away, and there's this impression that these are all incredibly you know, impoverished people, and absolutely Pakistan has a problem with poverty. But I must explain that amongst those 33 million people, the large majority of which were not impoverished before the floods. They were earning their way. They were, fam they, were, they were taking care of their families, of the earnings of their lands. Now they are homeless and impoverished. And the devastation on, on, the, on the standing crops mean that now we're going to face food insecurity. We all know we were anyway threatened with that because of Ukraine and supply line issues. Now there's a serious threat. And Anybody who's been following Pakistan particularly closely while all of this was happening, they'll know that we were in a very difficult, like everybody else is in a very difficult economic situation. But we were in a particularly perilous economic situation uh, because of some decisions that had been taken uh, in violation of IMF program that had uh, that our finance minister was in record as saying as, uh, you know, so Pakistan was in danger of default. And we had managed to pull us back from the brink and get our uh, second tranche, sorry, not second tranche, agree to the new tranche and agree, uh, uh, extension from the IMF. And that money literally came in the middle of August as the rains were descending. But all those estimates, all those figures have, might as well have been washed away with the floods as well. So we're staring at an incredibly difficult economic situation as well. Now, as the speaker before me mentioned, the people of Pakistan are incredibly resilient. We have time and time. In fact, they've been far more resilient than they need to be. But this is not a crisis of their make making. We contribute, Pakistan, 0.8% of the global uh, carbon footprint. And literally, the 33 million people of Pakistan are paying in the form of their lives, in the form of their livelihoods, for global warming that they didn't create. 
So as the UN Secretary General has stated, this is not about charity. This is about economic justice. And we've heard time and time again about how uh, the country I'm standing in, Europe, all the uh, great powers are combating climate change, are not only taking climate change so seriously themselves, but are championing the cause around the world. We hear about the Green Climate Fund and a hundred billion dollars annual commitment to fight climate change. Well, guess what? When your country is drowning in a hundred kilometer lake and a third of the land mass of your country is underwater, you find out there's no money. There is no international financial infrastructure to deal with the calamity of this scale. There is the loss and damage is a conversation we're still debating about happening. And that is incredibly frustrating. But now this is the opportunity in this crisis. That Pakistan's message is that it is us today, it could be anybody else tomorrow. And while we work to ensure we get the funds for our rescue and relief, while we have a clear vision about how we don't only want to reconstruct our reconstruction and rehabilitation place to take place, but we want to do so in a climate-resistant manner, a greener banner, manner, yes, we too aspire to build back better. with international financial institutions and there's novel ideas to discuss with uh, rather than the great powers we should say the great polluters um, to discuss with the great polluters about debt swap and other mechanisms that may help us here and now while there was no script for us Next time this happens to some other country, it's to bring our people to stand on their own feet, for our country to stand on their own feet. We commit ourselves because we would have never otherwise had such extensive investment in all of these uh, areas that have been devastated by the floods. And now there are two options for us. Either we do it cheaply and poorly and dirtily and wait for the next floods for them to be washed away again. Or we do it right. We become the test case, the leaders, for what we've heard and only heard about the great, about um, this green infrastructure, climate resilient infrastructure. And I honestly believe that domestically and internationally now, whatever our political preoccupations are, we have to understand the gravity of the situation. Before these floods, this was tomorrow's problem for us. We were working on green energy and solar energy and wind energy. And yeah, not everything's great, but we'd get there. And we'd seen historic floods that were devastating before, but we hope we could over them. Now this, there's an urgency. There's an urgency of now. And I don't wish upon anybody else to discover this urgency in the manner that we've discovered it today. So whether it's our domestic politics in Pakistan that is incredibly highly polarized, that too needs to accept the gravity of the situation uh, and rise to the challenge. But in the international geopolitical space as well, we have to ask ourselves what history will say of the choices that humanity made when they were faced with an existential threat. We saw how during the COVID pandemic, a once in a hundred year COVID pandemic that is still not over, 
that we did not rise to the challenge. It would have been incredibly inspirational. وزیر خارجہ بلاول بھٹو زرداری واشنگٹن میں مذاکرے سے خطاب کر رہے ہیں جس کا کچھ حصہ آپ نے ملاحظہ کیا